Good evening. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Professor Sean Elliott Martin. Professor Martin is an assistant professor and the coordinator of undergraduate and graduate intelligence studies at Point Park University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He has a diverse academic background as well as a range of collaborations with military and law enforcement entities. He applies creative interactive methods to teach courses in intelligence analysis, psychological operations, survival, combat, and related subjects. Professor Martin, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I've been to IWP many times and have always enjoyed it so much and have seen just fantastic presentations there. Um, I hope I'm not going to disappoint those who, who have come here expecting the kind of caliber of presentations that I've seen. Uh, I'll try to do my best though. So we're getting, uh, oh, there we go, perfect. What I'd like to talk with you about tonight, I've sometimes referred to it in shorthand as, as a theory with a lowercase t. It's not so much a theory as an observation that I've made about patterns in altering people's behaviors in very significant ways. This actually came, I don't want to go too far into the origin of it, but it came from a different, uh, a different life, another life that I had when I was planning to be a literature professor and my first graduate work was in literature. And I was looking at, of all things, a story by Clive Barker called The Midnight Meat Train. The movie's terrible, but <laughs> I think, but the story's fantastic. And it portrays this person who goes through this extreme experience. He's a quote, normal guy. And he ends up uh, becoming, a willing killer within, you know, far less than 24 hours. And I just started playing with this idea and thinking of times in history, times, you know, psychological cases. I'm very interested in psychology as well. Um, is this possible that someone who was otherwise uh, mentally balanced or relatively normal, well, relatively well adjusted, that they can transform in a short period of time, reasonably short period of time? And then it got me into thinking about broad, broad level, wide scale concepts of mental manipulation. So a lot of us have studied, it, certainly within the study of intelligence, looking at humans in particular, we've got mice and we've got rascals and we, you know, these acronyms, we look or acrostics and we look at the process of flipping someone to give us information. We can study this from a psychological point of view in terms of individuals and certain times, types of conditioning that can be done. But I wanted to get kind of a broader view of this would, that would work on multiple levels. And so it, it all started looking at this, this story, this fiction, and looking at the process, this four-step process that this person goes through, and then looking at other stories, and then looking at real life events, case studies, looking at everything from cults, which is something I find particularly interesting, and to nation states that indoctrinate people in different ways. So I'd like to pose this as something for consideration and, and you might want to kind of experiment on your own and look at different examples where you know that populations are being manipulated and controlled in certain ways and see if this applies. And I think in a lot of cases it does. So may we have the next slide, please. Thank you. I have kind of a, a silly sense of humor or um, and a dark sense of humor. So. Sam Neill is my favorite actor, so I always enjoyed his ability to portray an extremely likable, well-adjusted person and who turns into a monster sometimes within the same movie. This is from Event Horizon. And so I, I felt compelled to put him on here. What, what turns this into this it, on an individual level scaled up all the way to populations? So my students started calling this ATOP, because I, I list out these four, I recently added a, a fifth to it that comes at the beginning that's sometimes present and sometimes not. What I'm calling the hook or the appeal, whether you're looking at uh, 
occult, whether you're looking at just trying to get, you have to get somebody's attention in the first place before you can begin the process. In some cases, you have a captive audience, literally in some cases captive, we'll get into that. Um, but in some cases, you have to do something at first to appeal to them, and then this real process begins. Alienation, terror, opportunity, and power are the four parts of the process that I've been examining. Uh, may we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So these are some examples, and I'm not swearing to this. Um, I would have to be an expert on a whole lot of things that I'm not to, to be able to uh, say this 100%, but some of the things I've been looking into, the types of groups that, that tend to use this pattern would include cults. There, there are some wonderful examples of cults that seem to use the same thing. They, uh, these would include Jonestown, the Manson family, Heaven's Gate, Om Shinrikyo, you name it. Terrorist recruiting often uses this. To some extent, even street gangs can use versions of this. Uh, certain types of religious extremists that wouldn't necessarily be considered cults, but they would perhaps be considered extremists. Um, entire governments, uh, hopefully I'm not offending anyone when I say that North Korea seems to operate a whole lot like the biggest cult in the world. And, um, and they certainly use ATOP. In some cases, correctional institutions, and this is the uh, picture of the Tuskegee experiment down, I'm the, 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 sorry, the, the Stanford experiment, Stanford prison experiment down in the right hand. Um, I'll go through these, a couple of these really briefly. The one above that, that looks like it's a, taking place in a bank, is taking place in a bank. That's the case of Patty Hearst, which is probably the most famous case of Stockholm Syndrome, although it's not the case that Stockholm Syndrome was, was named after, where she was kidnapped, kept in a closet for, I believe it was three weeks, and ended up basically coming out and voluntarily and enthusiastically joining the group that had kidnapped her and brutalized her uh, significant other. So uh, we've got various cults, etc. A lot of different types of groups use these things on the level of one victim or one convert at a time all the way up to massive populations. So there's a lot of variety in this. But I've, I have kind of a compulsion. It's one of my favorite mental exercises to try to find common threads through varying phenomena and different types of organizations. And I think that this can help us to understand this a little bit better. Next slide, please. Here are some faces that you might recognize that I have a feeling you could say probably used this, this process that I'm talking about. Of course, we've got Marshall Applewhite. Um, we've got the, the uh, Kim family, Charles Manson, of et cetera. We've, the gentleman who's sketched on here or, or drawn in ink is the, yes, um, he's the, the head of, he's uh, Torquemada, the head of the Inquisition would be another example. We've got Coney at the bottom, the head of Om Shinrikyo, et cetera. I believe that all of these people had used this. I don't think that they. I don't think that they were passing a memo around. I, I don't think that they knew that they were using ATOP per se. So this is one of those examinations where I think they used what worked, and they were probably uh, groomed to do this in some cases by leaders that came before them. But it seems as though this pattern shows up over and over and over again. So let's go to the next slide, please, and I'll get into more specifics about this. Thank you. So I shouldn't skip ahead quite yet before mentioning what I, I'm loosely calling the hook or the appeal. In some cases, this can be skipped over, but if you're talking about recruiting people or just getting the attention of people so that you can even enter ATOP, if they're not already under your control or if you don't already have some kind of direct access to them. The appeal, it occurred to me just relatively recently after experimenting and studying this pattern for a decade and a half or so, is something that I should have put in a long time ago. I put it in parentheses because it's not always the case. 
Oh yes, um, I'm just noting in in chat here. Yes, please feel free to chime in. I um, I, I like it when people interact directly. I've been teaching so many remote classes where students that normally participate well feel shy, and I would love it if <laughs> if we actually had this as more of a discussion. But if you'd prefer to to talk at the end, that's perfectly fine too. Um, so you, I don't think that the hook should be um, overlooked. In some cases, you've got to get their attention in the first place. If you're familiar with the Nexium cult, um, it, the promise of success, the pro promise of uh, sexuality or, or sex, the promise of alien visitors, you know, it just depends. It's incredibly target audience specific, as just about anything is, you know, whether they're promising um, happiness. Uh, authority over others, intellectual development, wealth, of course. In some cases, the hook is number five, but it actually comes first. In other cases, once the contact is already there for whatever reason, I know that I'm speaking in vagaries, but it applies in so many ways that that's really the only way that, that I can do it. But knowing your tar target audience well enough, I'm going to be talking about this as though I'm teaching you how to use this. I'm actually hoping that you won't. It's just the easiest way to explain the process when you do it like this. If, if you picture someone like a, a cult, these are just, cults are not primarily what we're dealing with in terms of intelligence and, and world politics and things like that, but they're just such a great example of kind of the pure, one of the pure forms of this phenomenon, but it expands into obviously other groups. Um, you have to reach out to the, whatever disenfranchised group. Uh, Charles Manson rode through the streets of Haight-Ashbury after the Summer of Love had kind of all disintegrated and, and picked up uh, people who had run away from home, you know, disenfranchised, disillusioned teenagers who weren't sure what to do with themselves. And of course, his offering that he would make to them to get them to, to even listen to him would be different than, say, much later, decades later, the Nexium cult or the Heaven's Gate cult, where we, you were dealing with people who were, and Om Shinrikyo, actually, a great number of the members of Om Shinrikyo, the ones who had the sarin gas attacks in Tokyo, um, very high functioning in many ways, very, um, very well educated, in some cases, pretty well to do. So, but you have to be able to get their attention in the first place. And then we get into the good stuff. Next slide, please. So the first part of this is alienation. And the alienation part is crucial because you're, you're breaking people loose of what makes them strong. You're breaking them loose of their support structures. You're weakening their ties and their beliefs. This oftentimes involves a certain amount of gaslighting, uh, in, instituting a kind of paranoia. Now, there are two aspects to this the psychological alienation or feeling of isolation psychologically always has to be there in every case. In some cases, you can accelerate the process and ensure the process with physical, physical alienation or isolation. So if you're talking about one person at a time, you can take one person and physically throw them in a closet and you know, kidnap them and isolate them like Patty Hearst. It's kind of hard to do that with a giant population. You, you, there aren't closets big enough to throw you know, a whole population into. So the psychological aspect always needs to be there. In some cases, it, you can physically isolate them as well. And there are different ways to do this. If you look at North Korea, they're physically isolated. I mean, it's called the Hermit Kingdom for a reason. And of course, isolated with, in terms of communications from, a, from the outside world. But you can, you can do this on a large level, and the way that the part of it that always has to be there for this pro process is to get people to question the institutions that they hold as significant and authoritative. They're not going to listen to you if they're listening to somebody else that they've been listening to their entire life. So when you can get them to question, if you can basically convince them your, that your family your church or whatever religious institution, your educational institutions, your government have either been lying or they don't know. They, they've either been giving you disinformation or misinformation. And here is the real truth. 
then, as I say, you, you pull the reality rug out from under them. They start to question things. And then you can step up and say, this is, this is the actual truth. These days, this is easier probably than ever um, because of the just enormous amounts of easily manipulated information, easily misrepresented information, straight up disinformation online. Um, and this is where we get into those echo chamber phenomena that a lot of us have heard about and talked about. You've got individuals who basically do, quote, research. For those of us who try to take our research pretty seriously and are trained in it, it can be a little bit annoying when people use that term in and, and about as loose as a way that you can, right? Um, a lot of people develop an opinion that pops into their head or someone else gives to them. And then they go online and they look up 28 different people who say the same thing that they're saying. And they call that research when all they're looking for is, is a, a target to who supports what I already think. It's very easy to do that. So once you, once you get someone questioning, which is very easy to do because you're going to find these days contradictions to pretty much anything. So you can say, oh no, they, they lied to you about X. Look at this website. Here's 50 more websites that say that, that what you've been told is wrong. It's pretty easy to card stack. We're going to get into a little bit with traditional uh, propaganda techniques and how they dovetail with ATOP a little bit later. But the idea is you've got to make them think that they've either been intentionally misled or the poor suckers who've been teaching them things all of their lives just didn't know. And this can be kind of exciting for them. It, it can be scary and it's alienating as, a, as the name of the phase implies, but it can be a bit exhilarating too to think that they're onto something, that they're learning something new. The physical alienation can be actual physical isolation as in imprisonment. You could hypothetically institute a quarantine and there are all kinds of conspiracy theories that involve quarantines, but you're removing them from their family and their community. You know, cults don't let you go home at night. I and mean, that's one of the things that defines them as a cult, as opposed to just a smaller, lesser known religious institution or ideology, is that they, they pull you away from everybody else. The Manson family cult had their compound. Jonestown had Jonestown. You know, they got them out of the country for that one. They, um, Heaven's Gate cult, they all lived in a mansion together. So there are ways that you can physically isolate, but at the very least, you always have to make them think that they're mentally alienated from the world around them. There are different ways to do this. It can be on a spiritual level. It can be kind of a science fiction-y thing there, you know, with alien type groups, or it can on a, on a more broad and common level be just about government propaganda. Um, your government has been lying to you or the current regime of, that's in charge has been lying to you. They've been misrepresenting. They're really setting you up for some kind of a great fall. So you're getting them to question things. And this opens up the possibility that you can put something new in their mind that hasn't been in there before. If you try to institute new ideas, radically new ideas, actual paradigm shifts in a lot of cases to people who are very solid in their connections to their organizations and institutions and those paradigms, it's not going to work. It's as simple as that. So you have to break them down first. I think I've probably said more than I need to about that one. <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on, please. Next phase is you, you have to scare the hell out of them. And sometimes these are these go in a sequence. It's not, sometimes they kind of come bundled together, but this is more or less psychologically how the sequence needs to go. So you can be, you can make them afraid of it, maybe literally it, as in the Stephen King movie. <laughs> Couldn't help putting that in there. You all, just like with alienation, you always do one and then you sometimes add the other, depending on the situation. In terms of terror, there always has to be something out there that you're making them afraid of, whether it exists or not. It's that country is coming to get you. This regime is coming to get you. To the North Koreans, they literally teach their kids that Americans want to slaughter them in their streets. Um, from what I've studied, I'm not an expert on that, but it appears to be the case. It can be a, a, of a spiritual nature, obviously. You know, the apocalypse is coming. The world is going to be destroyed by any number of things, whether it's demons, a meteor, 
And I'm not saying that these aren't necessarily true. <laughs> maybe, maybe it is going to be destroyed by these things, and I'm not contesting anyone's religion. What I'm looking at is the way that these concepts are used for the purpose of getting people to change their minds and do things that would have been unthinkable on your behalf because you want them to. This is about brain, the brainwashing aspect. So you always make them terrified of something out there because they need that Mo that movement. They need to be broken. You've already gotten them susceptible to new ideas through the alienation process. Now you have to motivate them that something horrible is going to happen or something horrible is on the way. There's a them, there's an it, there's an event that's impending. Now it's sometimes, depending on your target audience in the situation, it's helpful if you're also if they're also afraid of you. But it's not the same thing. They should only be afraid. The way that this tends to to work is that they're afraid of you because you're the disciplinarian, you're the parent figure. You, you will punish them, but only because it's good for them. Only so that they'll, because what you'll do to them is to keep them from, from having to experience the other. Um, pardon me, I'm just checking. I just saw that things were in the chat. And I see a Q&A. Okay, what separates alienation if you described it from a similar process such as army <laughs> Uh Man, you just jumped right in there, Rick. Yup, I was saving that for last, my friend. Um, Rick asks, so what separates alienation as you have described it from a similar process such as army basic training where 18 year olds are placed in a new isolated environment where they're becoming soldiers from civilians? Um, nothing, <laughs> I hate to say it. I'm very close, uh, I have, incredible respect well so what i'm going to spoiler alert what i'm going to talk about at at the end let me hit answer live on this thank you i'll, I'll skip ahead and i don't mind doing it um i work with the 303rd psychological operations unit of the army reserves and i've taught them this and you know worked on other things and I, I coach my students to go out and do live role-playing exercises to prepare them for deployment and stuff like that and um, the first time I was showing this to the 303rd soldiers I was going through this and I said you know it's used by cults and terrorists and and one of the soldiers raised his hand and he said and the United States military <laughs> here's the difference I've been talking about this primarily in terms of negatives in terms of it being manipulative and it's used to get people you know to do terrible things um the i was saving it for the end you'll see in slide 14 the upside is that this can be actually used in positive ways if the terror really is real and you are preparing someone for something that is truly life-threatening and it is not a trumped up or exaggerated um, or misrepresented danger that they're dealing with, and your job is to make them fall into line but, and slap them around mentally so that they'll be ready for it. This, just like propaganda, you know, one of the first things you learn in propaganda studies is that propaganda in and of itself tends to be pretty neutral. The fact that it's manipulative or misleading is, you know, suspect. But anybody who's ever seen the ASPCA commercial where Sarah McLaughlin is singing in the eyes of the angels and they're showing, you know, the, the poor puppies and kittens. I'm an animal lover. I got to leave the room if that comes on or turn it off. I've seen, I've seen 60 year old, 300 pound, uh, you know, veterans tear up when they watch that. It's manipulative as hell, but it's, it's being used for a good reason. Um, ATOP, the one particular case that I can think of is exactly what you're talking about. In some cases, this whole thing is necessary to use, and it really is the best way to prepare people. But, um, and you, you can debate at what point is a line being crossed or, you know, where the gray area is, whether or not it's ethical or not. But I do believe that it is possible to use this while the vast majority of people who use it are using it in pretty suspect ways for their own power and, you know, glory and, wealth or whatever to get other people to do their dirty work for them um i think the the use of and i say the u.s military only because that's the one that i'm more familiar with but any hypothetically any military could be using this ethically to you know to to save their soldiers lives and get them to operate properly as a unit so um yeah great one that's i, I always love it when when somebody sees where i'm going and they jump right in there um 
Okay, I would love to ask you a question concerning the appliance of active measures, namely the part of Pan-Slav, oh yeah, uh, Slavic countries, especially the Central European countries. Is that also a form of ATOP trying to bring certain European countries based on nationality or made up history? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, I know a little bit about active measures more from my students than anything else, honestly, because I have some students who are extremely interested in uh, in the Slavic countries and their their history, especially with relation uh, to the Russian Federation and, and back in the Soviets. From what I understand, yes, I, I think it's I think it's spot on with this. As a matter of fact, I I wish that I could answer that in more detail. Um, it's not a subject that I'm. Um, terribly experienced with in, in terms of active measures per se. But from what I've seen, heard, read, yeah, I would say that that definitely falls into it too. Uh, next slide, please. This is awesome. So the kind of imagery that is depicted, you know, you've got, there are, whoever is doing the manipulation, it can be something of literally biblical, you know, types of proportions. The threat of nuclear annihilation obviously is something that's so real. I mean, in some cases, these the threats are real by scientific standards. I mean, stuff that could physically happen in terms of scientific possibilities as we know them. In other cases, we've got, you know, the Heaven's Gate cult believed that they, um, that the earth was going to end and that there was a flying saucer that was hidden behind the halo of the hill, the tail of the hill bop comet. And that if they committed suicide at the right time, their souls would ascend and they would jump on the spaceship and it would take them to heaven. Now, why their souls were able to make the leap to the flying saucer, but not the rest of the way to heaven. I don't know how they thought that worked out in their minds, but um, you know, it, it can be a range of things. But if you look at the imagery that has been pervasive throughout history artists are really good at capturing from some really scary stuff on a massive level and it's pretty compelling and this is the kind of thing that kind of bypasses logic centers in some people the threat of something this bad someone who is relatively reasonable under other circumstances if you've already made them question everything well they lied to me about this and they were wrong about this and they lied to me about that what else is different they start to see the entire world around them as this unexplored place that they're not familiar with that's the alienation you know they there's a certain kind of paranoia that can even come into this so it's really easy to slide this kind of a thing in there with very vi vivid imagery and then when you've got endless texts of various types to point to that and prophecy is used, you know, in a lot of cases. Um, but even even when it's in a more secular concept, it, this can still be manipulated. And even in a secular way where, you're, where the threat is not something supernatural, but you're saying these people are going to bomb us. These images can still be used uh, to great effect. And, and they are. Next one, please. So if you, but if you just stopped right there at alienation and terror, people would be pretty useless. The, the idea of ATOP is that you're trying to get someone to do what you tell them to um, and to act on your behalf, probably to do things, you know, that, that are either the dirty work or certainly as a force multiplier um, and things that you either won't do or can't do simply by yourself. If you stopped right there, though, with alienation and terror, everybody would, who fell victim to it would just be a gibbering idiot on the ground. <laughs> you know, you, you don't really motivate people if you don't give them some kind of a direction. So this one has a little more text in it. That I wrote a primer kind of, they, that's what they called it. I hadn't thought about it in that term. It's a supplemental manual for the 303rd PSYOP unit explaining this stuff. And here's a little bit from it. You have to give them an opportunity, an opportunity for escape, an opportunity. If you say everything is that you think you know is a lie or people have been lying to you and you're being manipulated, here's the real truth, something terrible is happening and you're a sitting duck, you need to go to the next level and say, but there's a way out of it. You get them worked up. When If you study the incredibly 
noteworthy and almost kind of disturbing overlap between propaganda studies and advertising and marketing. In marketing and advertising, if you study this, they always talk about the pain points, hit the pain points. You address the pain, then you take away the pain. You make them feel the pain, and then you tell them how you're going to fix the pain. It's, it's the same thing. So you soften them up so they're really susceptible to that pain. That's the, ins that's the alienation. Then you introduce the pain. All this horrible stuff's going to happen, but thank God you found us, or thank God we found you, or thank God you were born in this country, or thank God you joined the right group because we have an answer to this. We're going to we're going to get you out of this, but you have to do exactly what we say. And if you don't, we will punish you, but it's for your own good in some cases. Um, I'm mentioning here that false dilemma is a huge, if you're familiar, of course, with traditional propaganda, false dilemma is one of the classics. Uh, it's a this or that situation. You're either going to join our group and do what we say, or you're going to get annihilated, or you're going to, whatever is going to happen to you. So you've got to introduce this, it's very important. But if you just introduce that, you don't quite have their loyalty yet. You don't ha quite have their devotion or um, they, they, don't, they don't adhere necessarily to the group. You need to seal the deal. And that's the next slide, please. Power. So the final step, is you got them alienated, you got them terrified, you say, oh, but you can get out of it. And then you take it one step further and you say, not only will you not die in a nuclear explosion, not only will you not get your face blown off in combat, you know, um, or at least you're less likely to, your chances are much better of surviving this, but you're, you're going to come out the other end of this, whether it's the apocalypse or whatever the threat is, and you are going to ascend. You're going to rise. You're going to have power, authority. You're going to be one of the elite. You're, you'll be remembered. You'll have immortality, whatever the promise is. Um, this, this human need for transcendence, uh, at, or at the very least uh, growth, is something that's extremely powerful. Most people, if not everyone, it's hard to speak in absolutes, but it's a basic human need to want to somehow um, become more than you are. And while not everybody will take that to the extent of being superior to other people, that's a pretty common one too. So once you join the elite, you will inherit and lead a new world, right? Or, you know, one day those who are terrifying you will be um, subjugated to you. Or one day you will, e even the really extreme kind of cults and, uh, Satan worshiping groups and stuff like that, they'll say, well, you'll rule in hell. Even though you'll go to hell, you'll be all right. They, they, the mental gymnastics that people go through to, to try to make certain things seem like a good idea are kind of impressive in and of themselves. But if you look at the way that this process works, we can go through, I think on the next slide, I, I go into uh, back around to some more tangible examples of this. If you wouldn't mind going ahead. It's kind of half in and half out. There we go. So the effects of ATOP, I've just got some images here. Um, I think I think that the upper left might have been the work of Pol Pot, if I'm remembering correctly. We've got the Salem, uh, not sorry, not the Salem witch trials. No witches were burned in Salem, but we have witch trials in Europe with people being burned. These are the negative aspects of, of this, of course. We've got... Um, the bunk beds that you see are from the Heaven's Gate cult. We've got Jonestown, etc. The upper right, if you're not familiar with the Nexium cult, this was probably the most recent big one that I that I know of. It was supposed to be a group for success building and teaching people how to break through mental barriers and things like this. And as more was revealed about it, they were the leader Keith Raniere was doing all kinds of bizarre and uh, demeaning things, including branding his favorite female victims and things like this. We've got the Manson family, uh, the murders at the Tate house with people being taken out on the stretcher, um, Om Shinrikyo, the Inquisition, you name it. This 
is a very powerful force. Um, to extent, uh, an extent, I kind of joke that teaching people about this is kind of like handing them a loaded gun <laughs> that, that doesn't set off any alarms when they when they walk around. It knowing this, it probably it might even make it more if efficient. I don't know, but it seems like people have been doing a pretty good job of using it, even though they didn't know it as a top. In terms of some more examples, um, or or to review some examples, I believe that different aspects of um, the Communist Party used this, you know, during the USSR. You can have your own opinions about whether or not the US government has used or does use it. I'm going to stay out of that one. <laughs> um, but going back through history, it would be an interesting if you can come up. I'm, I have no doubt that there are examples that I haven't thought of. One of the most interesting ones that really got me into, interested in, in this subject was the the Nazis, and I'm not an expert on World War II, it's obviously quite fascinating, but from what I understand, one of the things that the Nazis did periodically is they would sometimes, and I don't know if they did it randomly or if they, if they really paid attention and chose these people, but they would, in a prison camp, they would walk up to one of the prisoners and make that prisoner a guard. So you've got someone who's already been pulled out of their home put into a concentration camp, literally had their identity stripped from them and given a number. I mean, the worst treatment you can imagine, they know that people are dying. They know that people are being uh, killed and they've probably seen it happen. So the alienation and terror are paramount, um, at, at, at very extreme. And all of a sudden they're told, you're not a prisoner anymore, you're a guard. From everything that I've read, these were the most brutal of all of the guards. The most, the most brutal, horrible guards were one, the ones that were former prisoners. Part of it, part of coming up with ATOP was I was thinking, why would that, why would that be? That just seems to fly in the face of everything that you might assume about humans having empathy. And, but part of this dynamic is that once somebody has been that mentally shaken up and that terrified and then given an opportunity to escape, not only escape it, but have power to make sure that that never happens again, um, to to have the upper hand, I think that that's part of that part of that dynamic. Let me just check the Q and A real quick. Yeah, real time. Yeah. Rick, um, that is an excellent question, and. <laughs> I'm all that's I almost don't even want to address it. I think that's a brilliant question. Let me put it. Okay, I'll, I'll put it this. Way. I don't know. Um, could this in fact be an example of a top if it is happening like that? Um, if if what is really happening is what some people think is happening and that there is some kind of conspiracy, then it would be precisely an example of a top. Um, I don't have enough data to tell you that that is what's happening. But um, I'll hit click the answer live. Sorry. Um, if indeed the, there is some kind of conspiracy behind COVID, as some people think, and that we've been isolated, which we are, I, I wish I were there in DC right now, as a matter of fact, um, if we were isolated, if we have been isolated intentionally, and if there, if this is some kind of a plot in, in if that were the case, and then all of a sudden this is introduced, um, I think the next step would be we would have to figure out what it is exactly that they're trying to get us to do. And I, and I think that there are a lot of potential answers to that. So, yeah, this is, you could have all kinds of speculation on that. <laughs> um, it's, it's a great application of it, at least to examine as a possibility, no doubt. Thank you. All right, so let's hit the next slide. I think we've only got one or two more. Oh yes. So I had mentioned before, if you're familiar with kind of classic propaganda studies, one of the uses for ATOP, one of the uses to understand ATOP, we're going to, other than actually doing your own brainwashing and becoming an evil uh, tyrant or something like that, which I hope you won't do. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think that if you do that, that ATOP is only a small part of it and that I didn't actually lead you on that path. Um, but one of the uses of it is to simply 
figure out when somebody's using it and it can help to understand um, maybe a little bit more insight into the severity and the specific aims of a group that's using it. You know, if you look at, at what a group is doing, if you're examining a regime that's on the rise somewhere in, in the world, and then you look at what they're doing and the ATOP flags go up and you think, wait a second, this sounds a lot like they're doing ATOP. What are they up to? This is not good. It might help to kind of alert you and then you can look deeper into it. Going along with that, you can also kind of understand the positioning of some of the classic propaganda techniques a little bit better. So depending on whose list you're looking at, there's uh, there are as few as 11. I've never seen fewer than 11 propaganda techniques, and some of these break down into smaller pieces where they use different words for them. And I've got depicted here a lot of kind of classic propaganda. Um, we don't have a ton of time. But I'll try to go through these very quickly. Assertion, of course, is just saying something confidently and probably repetitively. It's like the, I think it was Goebbels that said, if you say something loudly enough and often enough, most people will believe that it's true. Glittering generalities. That is when you basically use what some people call weasel words. You, you use words that sound good, but they don't actually say anything. So new and improved. Well, okay, how, it's new, that's great, but how, in what way is it improved? How much is it improved? Um, family values is one of my favorite glittering generalities. It means nothing. Are we talking about Adam's family values? Are we talking about Manson family values? But people will say, I stand for family values. And people who don't know what, you know, how to look for this stuff say, oh, wow, me too. Yay. Here's all my money or whatever. <clears throat> Bandwagon, we know. It's you know, assuming that if something's popular, it must be good. Card stacking is probably my favorite. I think it's the most devious overall because it's a logos technique, really. It's a lot, you can fool somebody's logic by just kind of stacking up the evidence <clears throat> in favor of what your point is. So you're using real facts if you do it well. You're just kind of ignoring or sweeping under the, under the rug or downplaying the opposition's data. False dilemma we talked about, and of course that's, you can either do this or this. This is the classic thing, parents, you don't want to go to law school? Well, I guess you're just going to dig ditches for the rest of your life. Uh, are those really the two options? You've got lesser of two evils, um, which is basically, okay, these are both terrible, but this one's not as bad as that one, so you should choose this one. And then like false dilemma, they're implying there's not an additional option. Name calling is just basically trying to <clears throat> make somebody look bad. And name calling is is tricky because the same name can be a good or a bad thing, depending. All of these are target audience specific. Everything is. So if you called someone a communist in the 50s in America, those were fighting words. Uh, other places, even in the 50s in Russia, <laughs> you know, that would have been, oh, thanks. Yeah. I, I like to think of myself as a good communist. Pinpointing the enemy, that's a matter of using oftentimes visual arts uh, or some kind of visual depiction, but dehumanizing or demonizing the enemy, whoever the enemy is, making them look as though they're kind of a caricature of themselves, using stereotypes, generalizations. It can be in print, but a lot of the time a visual is included. Testimonial is what some would call a false appeal to authority. Um, there are different versions of this, but basically having someone who is posing as an authority which can be legitimate if they're actually an authority. So for instance, if Neil Peart from Rush, God rest his soul, he just died recently. As a matter of fact, I just remembered, um, one of the greatest drummers of all time does a testimonial for a Zildjian cymbals. And he says, I've been using these for 40 years and they're my favorites. And I would, that's a legitimate testimonial. Not all testimonials are, are propaganda. But if the person only has name recognition or they're, they're famous, but they're talking about something that they're not an expert on, that might be an example. Plain folks appeal is when you're appealing to the, the common denominator. I, I saw a plain folks off between two politicians one time and it was a minor race. I don't even know why I was watching it, but they were basically in this kind of peeing contest about who had a more plain folks life. It, it was cracking me up. The one guy said, 
I practiced my first political speech in my granddaddy's barn. And the guy, the other guy was like, oh, we didn't even have a barn. I practiced in the middle of a field. They're trying to seem as though they're salt of the earth <laughs> so that the masses will, you know, support them. What's interesting about that one is if you look back a, a long way in time, there was a time when before democracy and, and republics started or in places where they didn't exist, this one really wasn't a, a big deal because you didn't really need it as much. When you didn't need the mandate of the masses, you didn't have to lower yourself to the level of the masses, which I think is interesting. And then transfer is the trickiest one. It's when you're blending two things that don't go together. And the easiest way to do, actually, we've got one right here. We've got uh, Churchill's face on the bulldog, on a British bulldog, and the British flag is in the background. Um, Churchill was British, but in a way, this is saying on, an un, on a subconscious level, he is Britain. Pretty much every politician in America that I've ever seen somewhere around in a dossier has a headshot of themselves standing in front of the American flag and possibly their state flag. If you wanted to demonize someone, you might have them stand in front of a Nazi flag. So you're taking two different things and blending them together in the hopes that an association will be made in the mind of the viewer. Let me check these. Any of these techniques by usually um, any of these techniques used by left slash Democrats against Trump? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're, <laughs> definitely, yes. They're used all over the place. Um, the uh, they're used by both sides all the all the time. Yeah, I don't even. There are so many. I don't even know where to begin. But yes, one hundred percent. I agree with you. Um, on the aforementioned topic of active measures, are you familiar with the work of, uh, no, I am not. I can email you the 19, oh, I'd love to see that. Oh, Sun Tzu, wonderful, uh, which appears astounding. Yeah, I would love to see that, thank you. This is an, an anonymous attendee. If you don't have my email already, please, uh, please shoot it over. I'd love to see it. Thank you. Done and done. Okay, so on the next page, if you don't mind, just wanted to do a quick little, this is just off the top of my head, but for instance, the alienation part, you could see as dovetailing how, you know, if you're looking at how do you use these more specific propaganda techniques to achieve alienation, terror, opportunity, and power, when you're convincing people of these things, you can use assertion, which might be, you've been lied to. Uh, what they've told you is wrong. This is the actual truth. Or pinpointing the enemy. These are the people who are manipulating you, which is, of course, ironic because you're manipulating. Uh, plain folks appeal could be used in certain ways for this by saying the, the elite are the enemy. You know, the people in charge are the ones that are the, the president or the whoever. Yeah, those are the ones, uh, the, the bankers, whoever you want to pin it on, who seems like they have more power than the person that you're talking to. There is so that kind of overlaps between pinpointing the enemy and plain folks. You can say, We're simple people, but we know the truth because we did X. This is goofy, and I don't know if anybody will remember this, but if you might recall one of the periods of Saturday Night Live when um, Phil Hartman, God bless him and rest him, was on there and he played Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer, and he, he was. Somebody, a, a caveman that was frozen in ice and he becomes a lawyer. It's this ridiculous sketch. And his big thing at the end of every case was, I am just a caveman. I don't know about your fancy, you know, whatever. Your world confuses and frightens me. I just know that when a man slips and falls in a store like this, he deserves $20,000 in punitive damages. That's, that's an example of, of plain folks appeal. But you can use that within alienation if you play your cards right. Uh, name calling, which I think I should have hyphenated, actually. Of course, you're saying these people are monsters. These people are, you know, enemies. They're coming after you. It blends with assertion. These, this is not meant to be um, all inclusive or exact, but just to kind of give you a feel of how these blend. Uh, how ATOP can be used as kind of the big picture skeleton or outline of this, and then this other stuff kind of works within it. The ATOP is. Um, is on more of a, a large scope. And then you kind of fit the other pieces in underneath. Pinpointing the enemy, of course, and false dilemma. 
the opportunity is often lesser of two evils. Yeah, you, yeah, maybe it's tough doing things the way that we say that you should. Maybe life in our regime or life as this person or doing it our way isn't easy, but if you don't, it's going to be much worse. And then, of course, card stacking, just showing all the good stuff about joining up or doing what we say and not talking about the downside. And then power, you can go nuts with this. Um, assert, you're asserting that you'll get this stuff. Glittering, gen oh, it'll be wonderful. It'll be heaven. It'll be paradise. It'll be amazing. You'll have immortality. You'll have glory. Well, what do these things mean? Show me some numbers. Um, everybody's doing, our numbers are growing every day. ISIL, of course, when their numbers were growing, that was one of their big things. If you saw um, Flames of War, I think was the name of the, the, the really big propaganda piece that they put out. And that was a big thing. I mean, that was a big part of their push. We watched that. It was kind of tricky to get it for obvious reasons, but we, we got it and nobody came banging on our, on our door for looking at it. Thank God. I think they knew. Um, what we were using it for because it was in class but we went through and just it, it's fun i love doing this with my students by the way one of my favorite things um and eleni i think is with us and she might have been in on this i was teaching our psyop class one time and an election was happening or it was in process and there were debates and I didn't suggest it or ask him to do this. It was one of my proudest moments as a professor. My students came in after a big debate and they said that they had a big party, which was, they probably did it as a drinking game, but they didn't volunteer that information. So I didn't ask, but they had to all yell out the name of the propaganda technique as the candidate was using it. So somebody would say something and they'd yell, everybody had to yell out, you know, glittering generalities. And I, the way I picture it in my head is that you probably had to drink if you, if you missed it. Um, they're all over the place. The, this stuff happens all the time. So as you go through different, you can look at car commercials, you can look at certainly anything that, uh, any kind of commercial and any kind of political work, they all do, they all use these. In fact, you can't be successful, I think, if you don't use them. Uh, the video I mentioned is your, he has a great lecture on YouTube on the active measures topic. Perfect. Thank you. I would love to see it. So if you're familiar with these, this is kind of how they might fit in. Card stacking, testimonial, and then uh, I mentioned here just the reason that I say that transfer, I mentioned card stacking being particularly devious. These are probably two of my favorites, and they're used really well with ATOP. Card stacking is great because it seems like you're giving evidence that you can make it look like you're being very unfair and unbiased if you do it properly and say, well, look, here's, here's the data. It's right here. Um, and you can even mention, if you do it artfully, you mention the other side, but you kind of downplay the other side. So it appeals, you know, even to somebody who's intellectual, they can potentially be fooled by it. Transfer is kind of the opposite. It's because it tends to be a little bit more subtle and it kind of bypasses the logic centers. Transfer is trying to set up um, a neurological, I mean, we're getting into neuroplasticity issues here. You're trying to develop an association between two things that people don't even know why they have that association. And I could give you specific examples, but I don't want to run out of time. Um, slide deck your email and 303rd information available. Absolutely, yes. Um, well, the slide deck I was having problems with, which is why I asked Hannah to to run it. So I'm hoping, and uh, maybe maybe she can send it to you. Any information uh, you want on the three or third, just let me know. And I would ask my hosts to please feel free to give my information, my contact information, to anybody who'd like to have it, who's on the call. Uh, last slide we pretty much covered, but if you'll go ahead. Just to show you that I wasn't making it up. Here we go, positive uses of ATOP, preparation for armed conflict. You read my mind. Um, it, is, it is possible that when you're preparing people for the some of the worst and most dangerous conditions, maybe ATOP's the way to go. I mean, maybe that is the best way to do it. Um, the fact that it's the soldiers that I know and work with who are the first ones to say, yeah, that pretty much sounds like boot camp or, you know, that sounds like certain kinds of training we did. That's not, I mean, I was thinking it, I didn't want to insult anyone. Um, but yeah, 
I think that we're in our rights to say that 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 is there's something to it. Um, any method of fighting against this? Wonderful, yeah. The oh, and could this be what former President Trump is were again supporters? Po I think political uh, to our anonymous attendee. I think political leaders use it constantly. Um, <clears throat> there are different levels and intensities, uh, obviously, of ATOP. You know, when you're dealing with a massive population, like I said, you can't throw them all in a closet. Yeah, you know, you can't go Patty Hearst. Um, they had a weird made up, I mean, technically all words and names are made up, but they, they had a weird name, Sindanistan. I always pronounce it wrong. Sindanistan Liberation Army. With a large population, it's a numbers game. You know, you're, you're, it, when you're in Intel, you know, you try to flip one asset at a time that's been, uh, you've been directed to by your target officer if you're in humans. In some cases, you need to, you know, you're, if you're kidnapping one person like Patty Hearst, you've got one person there and all your concentration is on them at one point. It still works. ATOP still applies. It's just a different application when it's done on a massive level because you don't need an entire population to go along with you. You just need the majority of them in most cases. So you're not going to have as much control and they might not see everything. But yeah, they're still using ATOP. Every, every, I think every politician attempts to use it on some level. They try to convince you, and some are more devious about it, and some are more underhanded, and some are more manipulative than others. But the pattern sticks. I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sold on it. Now, I'm the kind of person who will admit when I'm wrong. And if, and if, some, if something is truly disproven, and it just turns out that I'm, nope, then, uh, then I'll admit it. But so far, it looks like it's just all over the place. And you would throw it out there. You would try to say the other side's lying to you. You've been manipulated. It wasn't your fault. You know, that's the alienation. These guys are going to try to destroy your country. They're going to do this. They'll whatever. They'll raise taxes. They'll take away health care. They'll give you, you. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. But if you join us, we'll have a new world. We'll, you'll, you won't have to deal with these bastards. <laughs> you won't let, we won't let them do it. Follow us. And then it, everything will work out. In terms of, so that's the one, I'm gonna answer, that one is done. Um, is there any method of fighting against it? Yeah, I thought about this a lot, the awareness. My, my thought is, and this is kind of the next approach that I'm, the next phase of this that I want to get into is this idea of, if I'm looking at it like a system, like I teach survival combat, you know, um, self-defense, unarmed combat stuff, or the, the nasty kind, not the frou-frou, um, jump around kind. Some people will, will teach that as like taking out systems, right? You know, just like their organ systems, or if if you take out uh, the breathing, then you're going to do the trick. If you're, it, or like Clark talks about network analysis, and if you disrupt one part of the network, the whole thing can kind of fall apart. I believe it's possible that if you could identify that ATOP is going on and somehow address any one of these parts of the process, you could probably make the whole thing crumble. But in the way to do that in terms of counter propaganda, it would be on a case by case basis. So I think there is, um, and maybe somebody's kind of doing it already and I don't know about it, you know, um, I'm still working on it, but it's a fantastic question. Yeah, there's gotta be something that we can do when we identify this to be able to jump in and disrupt it. But I, I can't give you a blanket answer in terms of what that might be. But I, I like to think that the, the good news is that if the system works like I think it will, obviously the earlier you can hit it, the, e, the better um, in, in the A phase. But if you can disrupt any part of that, the whole thing kind of falls apart. I don't know if that wasn't probably the best answer, but it's all I've got at the moment. But I appreciate your, you guys are really on it. Not that I would expect any less from people from IWP. And then with ATOP and armed conflicts, even if it's meant to be positive, could it lead to exact, oh God, yeah, absolutely it could. Um, there, there's no doubt, there's no doubt. You can, you can start any number of things and it can be taken too far. People can misconstrue things. ATOP is a very dangerous game to play because it's so extreme that even if you intend uh, for the best of outcomes, when you are, especially depending on the level of intensity, because you've got to remember, I mean, you can pick number, you can make a scale one to 10 in terms of how hard you're hitting this and how crazy you're getting with it and intense, um, really intensive ATOP, you've got the potential to just traumatize people. Um, depending on how far you're going it, 
when you're using this method, I mean, you, you could have people completely lose it and take extreme measures that you don't even intend for them to do. Um, they, they could take violent action because they think you want them to when you didn't ask them to do it. They could pick different targets than you would ask them to do. So yeah, absolutely. When you're, when you're building this much energy, this much emotional energy is really a lot of what you're doing. You're, you're building emotional energy and tension and anxiety, and then you're trying to direct it the way that you want it to go. That's kind of like building a really big bonfire <laughs> and not taking certain precautions, you know, they, they can get out of control. So yeah, I would say unequivocally, unequivocally, yes. And there are times, you know, in, in history where we're almost out of time and I don't want to hold everybody up, but um, we, could, we could pick through and, and make a game of coming up with examples of that. In, in many different ways. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments before we take off? I really appreciate your time. I always enjoy talking about this stuff and it, it's truly an honor, I'm not pandering, I swear to God. <laughs> uh, I have such respect for IWP, I love the place, we've got a great relationship and I've seen so many wonderful presentations there. I, I hope that this is not uh, paled too much in comparison to, to the other ones that you've seen this year and that you might have some use for it. Anything else before we take off? All right, thank you so very much. Yes, um, thank you Professor Martin for joining us this evening and all of you welcome. tuned in here on Zoom and Facebook, um, if you're interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you, Pro Professor Martin, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. You're so welcome. Thank you. Have a welcome. great weekend. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Yes, Cheers. everyone have a great evening. Thanks. Bye.